Hello, welcome to MOT 115, Healthcare in a Transcultural Environment. Today we'll be reviewing basic transcultural communication techniques. So building a therapeutic relationship can take days, weeks, or months. Every relationship evolves at its own pace. A therapeutic relationship is an interaction that will help a patient heal both physically and emotionally, and it is based on, one, a professional relationship between a healthcare provider and a patient. And when we say a professional relationship, that's one where, you know, clearly the healthcare provider has earned the trust of the patient. Number two, focused on helping the patient solve problems and achieve certain well-defined, mutually agreed upon health-related goals. Number three, it will help successfully implement the healthcare process of assessment, diagnosis, planning, treatment, implementing treatment, and evaluating progress. And finally, number four, this relationship lasts only as long as the patient requires help in meeting healthcare-related goals. So the idea of a healthcare relationship is very specific and it has a goal at the end. Now, with some of our healthcare uh, folks, such as uh, general practitioners or doctors that you see every few months for a chronic illness, there is going to be a long-term relationship, but there's going to be goals within those long-term relationships, like get your uh, cholesterol down or get your blood pressure under control. The goals of therapeutic communication in a transcultural environment are explore the other culture's life experiences, values and belief systems, as well as their reactions to illness and treatment. Establish realistic, culturally acceptable health related goals. and take actions that will benefit their physical and mental health while staying within their personal and cultural values. Remember, a person's culture often defines how they perceive healthcare in the first place. So being respectful of that culture is to help you have better outcomes with patients. So the phases of a therapeutic relationship begin with the pre-orientation phase, which is where you learn everything you can about the patient before you meet them. You review their medical record, you note any previous hospitalizations and procedures, identify the symptoms that have brought the patient to us, speak to anyone who may have already cared for or treated the patient in a previous visit especially information about emotional state or cultural background. Keep in mind that any preconceived negative feelings you may have about a patient can hinder the development of a therapeutic relationship. Patients are individuals who may not fit any stereotypes we may have about a culture. So for example, if you find out that the patient that you're going to be working with later that day has certain uh, religious beliefs that they don't feel comfortable with needles, they believe that the body should not be open, for example, you know, you're going to have to respect that cultural aspect all the while explaining why something like a vaccination might be necessary. Um, you know, there, there's a dynamic in this country that people have freedom of religion and freedom of speech, but we also have to be aware that we don't want anyone to be hurt because of some belief system that is antiquated. Then the orientation phase, which includes taking the patient history and discussing current problems, and we perform a physical, psychosocial, and cultural assessment during this experience. Then we have our working phase, which is where we begin to establish the therapeutic relationship. We assess the person's concerns, strengths, and weaknesses, establish the expectations and responsibilities, decide on mutually agreed upon goals, establish a plan of action that works for the healthcare provider and the patient, set limits, 
and discuss a time frame. Encourage the patient to openly discuss fears, feelings, and frustrations. And again, a lot of times you're going to have patients who culturally may not trust Western medicine, and as such, building a trust relationship might have to come before any of these things because that trust has to be earned. It's not something that patients necessarily bestow upon their caregiver just because they have the word caregiver in their title. Then we have number four, the termination phase, and this includes patient discharge, changing jobs, patient health goals are met, so, you know, any number of things could end up ending the relationship between the healthcare provider and the patient. So, at the end of it, you want to outline the patient's strengths and discuss progress the patient has made under your care. Review areas for improvement. Discuss new goals and develop a plan of self-care for the patient. Discuss any feelings the patient may have about terminating your relationship and don't identify new goals for a patient who will not be in your future care. You know, this is where you literally are going to um, look at this is what you need to do next, which is to find a doctor who can begin managing this particular situation. When working with different cultures, healthcare workers need to keep in mind different cultures have different perceptions of illness and treatment have different ways of interacting with healthcare workers, have different expectations for appropriate verbal and nonverbal communication, and may communicate pain, fear, and need in a different way than you're used to. Now this picture here on the right hand side at the bottom is a picture of a woman in a um, fully covered from head to toe and her husband uh, who is standing next to her in the blue shirt appears to be the one who's doing all the talking. Now, you know, as an American, especially if an American woman, you might be like, wait a minute, she's her own person, she can talk for herself, but culturally, that's not what she's been trained to do. She has learned that her husband speaks for her, and we may not agree, but we have to accept the cultural dynamic in the room at the time. It is important to convey empathy, which means you understand their feelings while maintaining your objectivity. It is not the same as sympathy, which is when you feel sorry for someone. Empathy is when you enter another's emotional experience. If you do not show empathy, this can create distance between you and your patient. So. Here's a little graphic at the bottom to really kind of identifies the main difference between empathy and sympathy. The, let's for argument's sake, call it a dinosaur, says, I feel your pain, meaning your pain is something I know what it feels like. Sympathy is, I'm sorry that you're in pain, meaning I don't understand your pain, I don't get it, but I'm still sorry about it. <clears throat> we need to build trust, as I mentioned before, which is when a patient has confidence in their healthcare professional. If a patient trusts you, they believe you have their best interests in mind and that you respect their privacy. This will allow patients to disclose the most intimate details of their lives to you. Oftentimes, especially with women, we've been taught to be quiet about anything that is going on in our bodies and especially some um, cultures have a reluctance to talk about for example their gynecological health and that trust allows them to open up. Some patients especially Asians tend to express their emotional issues as physical issues psychosomatic so somebody comes in they're complaining of non-specific stomach pain, you start talking to them, you find out that they're under a lot of stress at home and at work and that uh, they're having problems with their own elderly parents. Well, in this particular context, you have a situation where somebody's 
personal stress is affecting their body in terms of how they feel. Patients who have encountered abuse in their lives may be distrustful of any authority figures, including healthcare workers. So, you know, somebody who's been in the foster care system, who's been bounced from household to household, they really don't have a very stable sense of who to trust. So they're going to be very distrustful, especially of people who've been, you know, quote unquote, set up to help them because in the past, the people who've helped them have taken them away from their parents who may have been terrible people, but they were still their parents. Number four, establish a rapport, which is warmth and friendliness that the two people are comfortable with each other. You can help build rapport by discussing non healthcare related information with a patient. So doctor comes in, they see you're wearing a baseball cap for a specific team. That doctor might ask you a few questions about, do you play baseball? Do you follow baseball? What's your favorite team? And they're not being especially nosy. They're just trying to get to know you a little bit, build that rapport. This will help gain the patient's trust and acceptance. And sometimes admitting that you have a similar issue can build trust, for example, insomnia. Now, it is not appropriate for healthcare workers to share their medical history in total with patients, but if there's a specific situation that seems very similar to what you've experienced, mentioning it in passing can help build the rapport. So now we're going to start talking about active listening, which is when you use verbal and nonverbal clues that show you are interested in the patient and you want to use what's called the solar technique. Now before we move forward, I just want to briefly address the concept of active listening. If you are talking to your love muffin and their face is in their phone and they are making grunts every once in a while, you pretty much know they're not paying any attention to you. Whereas if the person is following the story, asking questions, not looking at their phone, making eye contact, you know they're listening to you. So you're simulating that kind of experience in a professional relationship. So solar. S is for sit facing the patient. It implies interest in the patient and what they have to say. O is for open posture. Hands in your lap or on your notebook, legs uncrossed. This posture is non-threatening and non-authoritative. Avoid defensive or aggress aggressive postures, such as your arms crossed over your chest, your hands on your hip. And uh, again, that's kind of your Wonder Woman pose. Uh, L is for lean towards the patient while they talk. This demonstrates and conveys concern and interest. E is for eye contact, which also conveys interest, whereas lack of eye contact demonstrates lack of interest or even worse, disrespect. You must also be friendly. Eye contact without friendliness could be perceived as aggressive or disapproval. Different cultures react differently to eye contact, so be aware of how the patient responds. So again, some older Asians see eye contact as very disrespectful. Whereas, you know, someone who's been enculturated and is part of that American construct of what it is to be an American in terms of eye contact, meaning uh, is your way of showing friendliness and trustworthiness, that's going to be a different experience than with someone who might see it as disrespectful. Also, remember, if you are staring at someone and you're not smiling, you're just being weird. And then last, R is for relax. Be comfortable and smile in a friendly way, not in a creepy way. And, and here's where all those selfies come in handy. Figure out a good smile. It's not effusive, you don't look like you're crazy, and you also have a certain warmth to that smile. And, you know, as crazy as that might sound is, we don't pay attention to how we smile or our facial expressions, and sometimes they do come across as weird and creepy. Provide feedback. You may have to give information about behavior that needs to be modified. People never like to be wrong, so you have to be sensitive during this. 
And again, criticism will shut a person down very quickly. You want to describe the behavior, but not criticize the patient. You know, and again, the behavior would be not exercising or smoking or using intravenous drugs. And again, you're not criticizing the person, you're critiquing the behavior they're engaged in. Be specific. Focus on the details of the behavior. So if you have a patient who is promiscuous and has unprotected sex on a regular basis, this is again where the details, unprotected sex can lead to STDs or STIs, it can lead to unwanted pregnancies, all those kind of things. So again, the details are more important than actually criticizing or making the patient feel bad about their actions. Focus on behaviors that the patient can modify. You know, can you use birth control? Can you use a condom? Um, going back to our smoking patient, can you begin to use the nicotine patch? How do you feel about nicotine gum? Those kinds of uh, behavior modifications, again, are not focused necessarily on criticizing, but on helping. Provide feedback, not advice. And finally, provide feedback in a timely manner as soon as the behavior is recognized or observed. So again, when we are working with patients, we meet, we absolutely need to be mindful that they can take things the wrong way and we have to pay attention to all of their nonverbal communication and verbal communication to ensure we understand how they're taking the message. So here are some specific communication techniques. Approach and speak to a new patient slowly and wait for the patient to acknowledge you. Rushing can cause a patient to become afraid. Greet the patient respectfully. Address them with their title, Mr., Mrs., Ms. Try to pronounce their name correctly. Introduce yourself and help them with your name if they have a hard time pronouncing it. You know, and today all of us have kind of odd names here and there. Not everybody's name is Jane Smith. So we have to occasionally help someone pronounce our name. And that opens us up to helping, getting help pronouncing their name. A quiet setting is conducive to communication. In a hospital, draw a curtain. Also, determine if the family should be there or not during the conversation. Oftentimes, the patient may not want their children there if there's going to be a serious conversation about end-of-life decisions. Other things that may occur is, you know, a woman has been diagnosed with um, a cervical cancer based on HPV, and they don't necessarily want their husband in the room to learn about the problem this way. So, you know, you just have to be very sensitive to what the patient is comfortable with. Do not interrupt the patient and avoid changing the subject in a drastic fashion. So if the patient is talking about how much pain they're in, don't say, hey, how about those eagles? The little cartoon, I love this, the doctor will see you now. I can't promise that he'll talk to you, but he'll see you. And again, this is one of the main criticisms in the medical field is that patients don't feel heard. Oftentimes, you may not be able to do anything for a patient, but you can listen to them and you can allow them to be heard, which oftentimes is more than they've received from any other healthcare worker. Number five, if the patient seems nervous, seat yourself so you are physically below the patient. So they're on the examination bed, you might be on a seat several inches lower than the patient. It can be perceived as being supportive and that the patient is in the driver's seat. It's a perceptual thing based on the physical location. Number six, allow sufficient time. Try not to be rushed or anxious to leave. When a medical professional looks like they are in a super rush, it makes the patient feel like they're not being listened to. And again, that's what they want to know is, am I being heard? Number seven, explain the importance of the patient being honest about symptoms, especially if they appear fearful or nervous, and emphasize confidentiality. 
a lot of times patients are doing stuff they shouldn't be doing um, and they don't want to say it out loud because a it'll make it real or b they don't want their employer finding out but this idea of confidentiality is imperative so if you have a patient who's got a lot of bruises on their body and you find out they're being um, you know they're a victim of domestic abuse in their household that confidentiality is the only thing that's going to allow them to open up to you number eight listen to the words the patients use to describe their symptoms use those terms to communicate with the patient and not medical jargon you know one of the big criticisms of patients is that they go to a doctor and the doctor or the nurse or the healthcare professional is explaining things using medical jargon that they don't understand well patients don't want to appear dumb and that's how they feel so they won't ask they won't say anything offer the opportunity to the patient to ask questions keep in mind Asians especially often feel it is rude to question an authority figure so again what we're looking at here is everybody is different and you know we can't look at all two billion Asians as a monolithic cultural group you know Chinese people are very different from Japanese people Japanese people are different from Filipinos Filipinos are different from the Thai so you know we can't look at these over generalizations as being applicable to every single person you know remember the generations alone will define a culture so a 20 year old from Japan is going to be much different than a 60 year old from Japan and we have to incorporate everything we learn into our knowledge base number 10 mirror the behavior of the patient if they speak slowly you should speak slowly if the patient speaks in a low calm tone you should speak in a low calm tone mirror their use of eye contact especially when they come from another culture focus on a single experience mentioned by the patient and explore it in more detail once you are in a conversation the patient will tend to open up more about their symptoms so if a patient comes in and they're talking about non-specific pain in their feet or in their legs you know start saying you know talk to them about the specifics asking them questions and then that'll lead to more symptoms that oftentimes there there's numbness in their leg or that they feel faint sometimes and you can kind of work to pull the information out in a gentle non-aggressive way paraphrase in order to clarify statements this is also very important because what the patient may have said may not have been what they meant so when you paraphrase you're also validating that you understand where they're coming from and that you understand their issues allow silence during the interview this gives the patient time to think and speak if the silence goes on for too long then pursue the issue by asking if the patient is concerned if the patient looks angry while silent for a long time ask them if they are upset you're not confronting them you're trying to help them and that's a major difference in confrontation where we're pushing someone we push and we push and we push and if you've ever been in a relationship you know what I'm talking about and you know trying to find out what's wrong and saying you seem upset is there something that I said or did or can you give me some details you know doing it in a non-confrontational way is going to get you more information pay attention to nonverbal cues especially when their words do not match their nonverbal cues so we have our verbal and we have our nonverbal so somebody is smiling and they look happy but their words are menacing or angry and you have to ask yourself why is there such a disconnect between their facial expression and the words coming out of their mouth and you should also look at things like posture their gestures their facial expressions the use of personal space the use of touch and the frequency of eye contact 
other nonverbal communication in, in addition to the ones I just mentioned. Um, the sounds they make, you know, some cultures do not necessarily say a lot, but they make noises like mm or uh-huh. Those will tell you if they are angry or uh, acceptable or agreeable. Body movement, are they in pain? Are they guarded? Again, all of these things become very important. Their reflexes, how they use silence, their appearance and their cultural artifacts. If you have somebody coming in and they're wearing a crystal around their neck, you know, this is somebody who's probably more comfortable with folkway medicine, medicine than they are with the traditional Western medicine um, perspective. So we have to be respectful of those things. And again, you don't have to agree with them. It's just about respecting. Use therapeutic touch, but only when it is acceptable. It is more acceptable to touch a child in a therapeutic way than an adult. Children, they don't have a lot of issues about being touched because their mom or dad or brother or sister are always, you know, pushing them, shoving them, changing diapers, whatever. Adults tend to be a lot more standoffish, and we have to be very aware of that. Hispanics tend to welcome therapeutic touches, avoid touching Vietnamese, Cambodians, Hmong, or Thai children on the head when you first meet them because these cultures believe that the head is the site of the soul. When working with adolescents, you can touch their hand or shoulder, but avoid any obvious signs of emotion. Adolescents are a hurricane of hormones and the feeling that the world doesn't understand them. So any attempt to connect with them is going to be seen with suspicion. Minimize touching anyone from Southeast Asia. Explain assessment techniques as you examine a patient. Southeast Asian countries include Cambodia, Cambo sorry, Cambodia, Laos, Burma, which is also known as Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, East Timor, Indonesia, Philippines, and Singapore. Again, if you have somebody who's been in this country their entire lives, you know, their grandma was from the Philippines, they're probably going to be as, you know, westernized as somebody who came, whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower. However, there's always these cultural elements that are important to keep in mind just in case.